Um, I have here with me uh, Joan Rogers, who is Executive Director of Kinsella Magnet Schools of Performing Arts, and Eddie Duran, the Artist Director of Kinsella. Uh, welcome. So Thank glad you, that you're so. here with us today. And I'm um, so excited to uh, hear more about uh, the Kinsella Magnet School of Performing Arts. And uh, first of all, um, Joan, would you just tell us a little bit about your mission um, and, and how you got started? Well, we're five years old now. Um, and uh, it started with Eddie, who is the artistic director of the school, um, went to a magnet school conference many years ago out on the west yeah. coast and learned about how uh, in particular magnet schools that uh, have a, are in the performing arts out on the west coast were forming nonprofits that in essence were education foundations mm -hmm. that were being formed just to support the school um, with the thought in mind that if you know if budgets got tight and things changed, those nonprofits would be able to help with a funding stream so that programming for the students would not be impacted. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So we went to a, a, a conference, a Magnet Schools of America conference, and uh, we took a workshop and we heard from uh, from schools in Texas and California and Maryland and they were, were talking about how they had established a non-for-profit to support their endeavors. Uh, not a lot of people realize it, but VAPA schools, so visual art performing art schools, are the most expensive schools. Um, it just costs a lot of money to run those, school, mm -hmm. th those programs, you know, whether you're putting on shows, you constantly need supplies. So uh, we heard um, some folks from those states talk and, uh, they talked with passion and uh, we were sold on the idea and we were really at that time, you know, this is like, you know, maybe six years ago because our organization, Kinsella Arts Incorporated, has been in existence for about five years now. So maybe like six or seven years ago and it took about a year to a year and maybe two years to really do the research, do the homework, talk about commitment, um, you know, what it really meant to open up. Um, our very own not-for-profit, and it was definitely more than we had thought. We weren't expecting it to be as in-depth as it was, but we had some good people who supported us, um, you know, with the legal matters as well. And uh, after a couple of years, we uh, put it together with an advisor. That advisor said, you know, you should try to find one point person who could support your mission and support with grants. And we interviewed a few people and we found Joan. She was one of the people we had interviewed, uh, you know, which was a special point because we, you know, we were talking about, you know, who's going to be kind of our point person out in the community, not in the school, but our non-for-profit point mm -hmm. person, you know, and it had to be somebody who, you know, uh, was passionate about kids and about arts, and, you know, Joan kind of had that on her resume, and when she spoke about it, we are like, she's the one, so, you know, the community, she was really our first community person, and uh, from that point, just reaching out, and, and uh, we, you know, it kind of as grassroots as you can get, mm -hmm. you know, really one board member at a time, <laughs> you know, um, having them get to know us and the board started to grow and, you know, we started to talk about, you know, uh, um, you know, where, where was the need, you know, specifically because in a school there's so much need, right? right. And uh, so where was the need and, um, yeah, it's been great. You know, it's been great. It's five years. Um, and uh, we just had our second uh, kind of major uh, fundraising event. We had a, a wine tasting and a beer tasting, and um, we had a good crowd that came out. Right. You know, it was great. You know, so it's all starting to the synergy starting to come together. You know, that was about seven years ago. That's how it all started. That's great. That's wonderful. And um, we talked a little bit earlier. Um, about going from a neighborhood school to a magnet school. Can you tell me a little bit more about yep. uh, that? So, you know, this is, a, yeah. Kinsella Magnet School of Performing Arts is like the little engine that could. Um, you know, um, identified, you know, during a time when, um, 
you know, really Hartford schools generally was, was you know, really being um, investigated in terms of, you know, the, Dr. Adamowski, the superintendent at that time, was really talking about redefining the schools and uh, every school having their autonomy and every school being able to identify, you know, where they want to go and, and the direction that they want to go in. And um, so, you know, you had a family at Kinsella, a, a neighborhood school, uh, you had a group of teachers there, and um, it had been a it had been a, a arts magnet school for a couple of years. So it went from a neighborhood school to an arts magnet school, and then the third year uh, we became a performing arts magnet school. And that's kind of when everything started to change. Um, you know, our physical education. Uh, is dance, so we are able to satisfy that standard through dance. We introduce drama as a core component. So most schools you might have, you know, uh, uh, you might have uh, art, uh, music, and PE, right? So we have, you know, musical theater, uh, drama, vocal performance, instrumental, stagecraft, production, digital theater now, and you know, really. Um, creating a program that is so appealing that students from all over Hartford and from all over want to come. And once those components started to happen, and that became those became opportunities for students, really exciting opportunities where we train students and you know. Um, um, feature over a hundred shows a year. I know that sounds crazy, but we produce close to 20 productions every year, and each each production gets anywhere from, you know, uh, uh, four to eight runs. And, you know, when all that, you know, goes on stage, it mm -hmm. comes out to about, about a hundred shows, uh, more than a hundred shows, and it's Amazing. it's absolutely incredible. But that's yeah. how you know. That's well, how I we... think the important thing to note, though, is before it became a magnet school, when it was a, a, a Hartford neighborhood school, um, th the students weren't thriving. Um, they they were scoring in state test in the thirtieth percentile, oh. only in the thirtieth percentile, and then after becoming a magnet school within within just a handful of years it was up until what the 80th percentile yeah we reached up to uh, 82.9 yeah. yeah Joan I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people might think well okay so you went from being a neighborhood school to being a, a magnet school okay so what you got a whole new group of students it's like no we kept those students wow. mm -hmm. we kept those students and we diversified our our student body as, a, as an eighth grade group kind of graduated on now we're pre-k to 12 but back then we were pre-k to eight as that group went out you know we'd bring in a more balanced pre-k but those students who were in those grades were the neighborhood schools and you know that year alone you know we we scored above uh, 13 points on the Connecticut mastery test the year before that it had been point two and the year before that had been point nine mm -hmm. suddenly this performing arts magnet school started to thrive and you could see it academically and, and the scores and the scores well, and I think to note also is um, there's so much Dr. Documentation and evidence that speaks to uh, student engagement and parent engagement mm -hmm. and the impact of that on student achievement. And um, like Eddie said earlier, when parents can come in and see their kids, whether it's a music concert that they're playing, like the Strings concert, or it's a musical theater production, um, it gets them more engaged in the school because they're seeing um, these things that their kids are doing and, and they're loving they're loving it and for the kids um, I've worked with education systems uh, in Connecticut before I worked with Kinsella there's an energy in that school those kids I mean you don't you're not seeing behavior problems very much because they want to be there mm. they're very invested they're in their own education mm -hmm. because they're engaged in it and I think that's why the scores went up as quickly as they did because Wonderful. the students are fully engaged in their in their education and I'm in the school a lot I don't you know it's just a, an energy that I've not felt in other mm -hmm. schools um, so I think when Eddie went out to that conference seven years ago and was able to forecast what the future could have been uh, he was absolutely right because right now as we all know, in the state of Connecticut, you know, we're still without a budget. And it, we're a Hartford school, which means that, we're a Hartford magnet school, which means that our primary funding comes through the city of Hartford, the mm -hmm. Hartford Board of Education. 
and that is not in a good place right now either with Hartford having recently considered bankruptcy. So it's kind of a double whammy to be a Hartford school in Connecticut right now, mm -hmm. but by having this nonprofit, uh, we're certainly not funding teacher salaries. I won't go that far to say we're doing that, no, mm. and that's not our mission. Um, but we are keeping certain programming for the students intact mm -hmm. that might not be so um, in this in this economic reality that we're living in. Mm -hmm. So um, in our Hallmark program that Kinsella Arts Incorporated has brought to the school, and we're in our fifth year of running it, is what we call the Family Literacy Workshops, and they're geared at students in kindergarten through grade two. Um, we host six evenings a year from fall through spring. Um, one night we do kindergarten and first grade, and the, the next night we do second and third, gr the groupings together, uh, those two grades. And it is literally um, a program that um, has made such a difference in helping parents know how to teach their kids reading strategies because one thing about our school is m many of the parents, um, because 50% of our student population are Hartford kids, mm -hmm. many of our parents have not been to college, um, so they, you know, they don't necessarily even know how to teach their children to read. And there's so much evidence that speaks to reading, you know, 20 or 30 minutes a night at least with your kids and how that correlates to mm -hmm. greater school success. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, also correlation between students that don't read on grade level by the end of third grade. Uh, there's, you know, projecting that out into the future, there's a high correlation with incarceration. So it behooves, uh, behooves us all to make sure that our children can read, Absolutely. that they're literate. Mm -hmm. and, and this program, we, the kids don't leave school. We no. provide after school care so the parents don't have to worry about meeting a bus or because our kids come from 49 different zip codes, mm -hmm. so the parents don't have to worry about going home to get their kids to come back to Hartford. The kids stay at school. We have an after-school program. We provide them a snack. When the parents come from work, we provide dinner. We provide childcare for any other younger siblings that might be with the parent, um, so that that parent or parents can focus on that one child who's in kindergarten or first grade or second or third, depending on the night that, you know, the grade level of the night that we're offering the workshop. And they learn strategies to engage their, their child in a book and in reading. And that has had a huge impact. Yeah, and just think about that. So, you know, here, um, here the, we'd had this incredible success right, uh, from the 37th percentile all the way up to almost the 83rd percentile, right? And we started to ask the question, okay, well, where's the need? Mm -hmm. You know, so we went to, you know, our, our, uh, our teachers, the, you know, the board of Kinsella Arts Incorporated, the not-for-profit arm of Kinsella Magnet School of Performing Arts, two, certainly two different organizations, two entities. And they said, well, let's ask the teachers. We went to the teachers. And the teachers really said, you know what? We need our parents to read with their kids. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. So we went back, and that's a huge challenge right there. You know, that's a huge challenge, because a lot of you know, public education funding has to go specifically to the student, right? Mm -hmm. Specifically for the student. So here we were able to use um, you know, some, some funding that you know, uh, we had received to, to support this idea. And um, and that's exactly what we did. You know, we 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 talked to the teachers. We said, okay, we're going to have this program. Okay, what are the obstacles? Well, you know, think of one obstacle. Okay, they have to get on the bus and then they have to uh, get off the bus and then their parents are going to have to drive back. Some of these families come from as far as Enfield, Ellington, right? So they'd have to drive back. It's like, okay, well, let's hold on to the kids then. We'll give them a snack. They could do their homework. Parents will catch up around 5 o'clock. Awesome. Okay, so we mm -hmm. took that obstacle Perfect. out. Well, then dinner, right? Not everybody knows. Get a group of people, provide dinner. Everybody's going to be a lot happier, right? So, so let's all eat together. Let's break bread together. Okay, awesome. So we ate, you know, we took care of that. And that's kind of, that's kind of gone through some phases as well. 
Um, and, um, you know, then, okay, well, what do we really want to provide? Well, we want to provide about 45 minutes of instruction with a teaching artist. So we bring in Leslie Johnson, Tom Lee, some other teaching artists. We use um, certainly people from the school as well. I've contributed. Um, and we're going to provide a 45-minute workshop on how mom, dad, or grandma, grandpa, anyone in the family could read with this child at home. And we're going to show you how to do it. And then if you have another child, younger siblings, right, we're going to provide child care for that sibling so that mom, dad, family member, you could really spend 45 minutes reading with, with this child specifically, right, mm -hmm. in K, first, second, or third grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they go through that. Uh, at the end, they get a book because uh, kids who have a home library statistically do better. Mm -hmm. Um, so they get a book to take at home to start a library or to continue. Um, you know, they get milk and cookies at the end because, again, it just makes them feel good, yeah. right? And that's what it's yeah, about. Yeah. There's a vibe. And well, Joan was alluding to that before, yeah. right, Joan? And I think what's very interesting, too, is this, is a great, this has been grant-funded, and we thank our funders for providing the grants for this literacy, Absolutely. family mm -hmm. literacy program. And part of that is that um, I put together a parent evaluation um, and a teacher evaluation, too, of the program. But the parent evaluation has been very revealing. Um, you know, parents over five years, and like Eddie said, it's constantly new parents that are doing this program because their kids are moving up in grade level. Mm -hmm. um, parents, you know, have consistently said, oh, I thought teaching my child to read was just sitting next to them at night with a book. That's not teaching your child to read. Yes, you're sitting with a book, but there are really reading strategies um, to engage a child in a book. There's questions, open-ended questions that you can ask your child that will get them engaged in the book, that will help them look for clues in the story. Mm -hmm. There are just ways to engage um, students, children in literacy that isn't like s second nature to parents. Right. That, you know, they need to be shown how to do this. And the teaching artists are amazing at how they do this. I mean, the first time I witnessed a workshop, I mean, my kids are grown and out of the nest, and I went, wow, I wish that I would have been shown that as a young mm -hmm. parent, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and it's resulting in, in higher student achievement. So um, that, you know, thus far that is the major program that Kinsella Arts Incorporated has brought to the school and funded for the school. And that's all part of the family literacy workshops. Yes. Everything I just described, yeah. right? That's what we call it. Yeah. We do you know, six wonderful. sessions a, year, a school year. And we get, you know, we try to get people, you know, parents to come out. We work with the teachers. You know, we try to identify students, like which students, like who? Like, let's call yeah. that parent. Let's try to get them to come, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get them to come to, to yeah. three. So we have three sessions for each of those grades over the course of the year. Right. If they come to all three, they get included in a raffle. It's really fun. Yeah. And uh, there's tons of excitement about that. And they get a tab. And we raffle off some Barnes and Noble gift cards as well, and that's great mm -hmm. as well. You know, yeah. And if there's to to anyone out there that wants to come and witness what these workshops are like, our first set, yeah. um, our schedule for November 13th and 14th, beginning at five o'clock. Yeah. At the so school. they're open to the public. Oh then? yeah, you can come. Absolutely. You can come. Okay. Sure. It's you know, um, the, seeing the, is believing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, you really, you really start to see a, a community right. of people. Of readers. Yeah, of readers. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and students, kids who start to appreciate it. They're really appreciating. Yeah. The reading. Mm -hmm. I'd say more than than anything. That's that's what we're trying to communicate during that. Is you know. And then at the other that. end of the spectrum, um, we'll yeah. talk about our high school students and what Kinsella Arts Incorporated has done for them. Um, is actually a program that hasn't cost anybody anything except time mm -hmm. and coordination. Um, as I said earlier, many of our students, um, high school students, you know, are first generation college bound. So the whole college process is completely daunting to them mm -hmm. and their parents. Um, writing a resume, which is required for college applications these days, um, is something that they've had no experience with and, and parents aren't really qualified because of their background to, to help them with that skill. Um, interviewing skills is another thing that they, you know, they've not been exposed to, so we, through our board, because uh, our board, we have, we have board members that come from uh, the major insurance companies in Hartford, like Aetna, the Travelers, the Hartford, 
Um, we are um, about to bring on a new board member next week who's with Pratt & Whitney. Um, all of these board members that are of the Greater Hartford community, um, they serve as mentors uh, at the high school, and we do like two days of resume writing, where you know they sit with one or two students, and out and we have we have different paperwork we put together ahead of time that shows the things that should be in a resume, but. You know, to, to just hand a document to a student and expect them to understand what you're looking for mm -hmm. is very different than having a mentor work with you, like for you know a, a school period of time, which is what about 45 minutes. That's about right. Um, mm -hmm. And then give them homework, like now go home and refine this, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not their teacher. And for a lot of kids, um, just to feel that investment in them from somebody they don't even know. That's from you know the Greater Hartford region, um, and then that same mentor comes back and does interviewing with them, teaches them good interviewing skills, talks to them about dressing for success. So that's what we're doing at the high school mm -hmm. end, and mm -hmm. we have a, a dream or a desire to how um, for what we want to do for students in grades four through eighth, um, and it's about math or numeracy. Um, we're trying to put that program together uh, to help the students and their parents because many parents now feel that they can't support their student beyond fourth grade in math. Mm. That yeah. math has become so complex. Right. That is true. That is so true. Right. Mm -hmm. So we kind of really want to offer the same kind of program and, and numeracy uh, to support parents so they in turn can support their student. Um, so we're working on that's our next step, I That's think. Fourth, step. like fourth to eighth grade, might be third to eighth, depending. We might get a little overlap there, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know that's it's such an it's such an important piece for us um, not not only to serve that population because we're obviously serving the lower grades third grade mm -hmm. down in the high school um, but but with the math to, to support those teachers with those right. concepts and those you know new strategies of instruction mm -hmm. and um, we already have the model so pretty much following the same model we have for family literacy night but we'd call it family a uh, numeracy night yeah. You know, and you know, same thing. We'd hold on to those kids. They'd stay after, you know, and more or less, this is, you know, we know that much. We know that model works, so mm -hmm. we're ready to just apply that with numeracy, yeah. and uh, reach out to those uh, fourth to eighth grade families. And I'll say this. I think it'll be even more challenging. I don't know why this phenomenon occurs, but as students get older, uh, parents tend to. Um, just be, I guess, less present. I know that sounds crazy, but by the, the time they get to high school, it's almost like a little hands off at mm -hmm. that point. Um, but we really want to engage those sixth, seventh, and eighth grade parents, and, and you know, and and bring them into the school and get that dialogue going, get that conversation going. Um, you know, students are taking higher level maths. Is you could be have, you could have a seventh grader taking pre-algebra at this point, you know, and, yeah, you know, they're taking amazing. geometry in, mm -hmm. you know, eighth or ninth grade, you know, um, so mm -hmm. um, we just want to support that. That's a, that's our next big step. That's great. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, that you have students coming from 49 different zip codes. I would say it's right in there. I would say mm -hmm. it's definitely between... Uh, about 43, 44 to about 49 mm -hmm. different zip codes. So it, yeah, they come so from all, all over, over the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Inspiring, yeah. all over Greater Hartford. Greater Hartford. We have had students from outside of Greater Hartford okay. come in as well. Um, they really just have to provide transportation into Greater Hartford, and once they're in, uh, in in that you know county line, then they're able to take public transportation to okay. the, to the school. Um, but yeah, I gotta tell you, it's uh, in many ways, it's it's just utopian because you see all these faces. You see, see, you know, we we mm -hmm. had our cultural heritage uh, potluck dinner uh, last week, and it, it's absolutely inspiring. I love being there. Mm -hmm. I love taking photos and and videotaping uh, the whole experience because. Um, just gives me a lot of hope yeah. you know you get people from different backgrounds different you know socioeconomic backgrounds and once you know the unifying factor is the arts so once they're you know in, immersed in that um, in our environment well, you know in our familia right uh, that we have 
painted boldly on our wall. As soon as you can't come in, you can't miss it. Um, you know, they, they, I think they really feel like they own the school and they're part of the school. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, um, I think there's a real sense of ownership. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Some of our students travel one hour, one way to get yeah. to school mm -hmm. and they're, they're more than willing to do that. So two hours a day mm -hmm. on a bus so they can get to school. And I'll be, I'll be giving our, uh, you know, board members or our visitors a, a tour and I'll see a student and I'll say, hey, where are you from? You know, they might say, you know, I'm from uh, uh, Ellington or I'm from uh, as far off as Canton or, uh, yeah, way down even Coventry, East Hampton, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, and I'll say, how long did it take you to get here? And they'll say about, you know, uh, 45, 50 minutes. And I say, what Poss could possibly make that worth it? <laughs> you know, and it always comes back to the vibe, to the opportunities, um, the things that I think de define mm -hmm. the school, you know, specifically, you know, comprehensive training, those areas I had mentioned before, you know, cultural exposure, seeing shows, which is another area mm -hmm. that we, we are, we're going to our non-for-profit with as well as, you know, how are we going to support, you know, cultural exposure, mm -hmm. you know, kids going to see shows, right? right. Uh, so they could talk about shows and having these authentic experiences, you know, um, deeply cut, probably are deepest area in terms of cuts has, has been in cultural exposure. Uh, and then of course, arts integration, using the art as the vehicle to deliver academic content so you could engage students in such a way that, that they're having fun while they're learning and they're you know, just super present mm -hmm. you know, during the instruction. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, um, you know, those are the, those, that's really when you think about the mission of the not-for-profit. The mission of the not-for-profit is to financially support comprehensive training, cultural exposure, and arts integration at Kinsella Magnet School mm -hmm. of Performing Arts. It's one sentence. I've said it so many times over and over. <laughs> and that is, that is the mission of the organization, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, to support. And the, the benefactors are the students. And um, and the um, you know sustaining these programs you know to sustain and support those three yeah. areas wow. and we're so thankful that we mm -hmm. I think I think you know I think um, um, I think it, more schools should do it uh, in terms of you know really taking control mm -hmm. of of their um, God I think about five years ago and if we had it you know, six years ago, because you know, we had some road bumps, you know, like the legal stuff really mm -hmm. was holding us up and uh, we could have quit. And um, I think we didn't because we had, at that time, there were a lot of parents on the board. Believe it or not, our board is mostly made of community members who right? don't yeah. even have kids That's in our right. school. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're yeah. But wonderful. that wasn't always the case. That wasn't always the case, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, it did start off with those, um, mm -hmm. with those families who, who started and supported. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I'm, I'm so glad we, you know, mm -hmm. kept doing it because here we are. Everybody knows the economic climate mm -hmm. right now, you know, and, uh, yeah. and uh, I, you know, there's no way, there's no way, um, at least right now, that Kinsella Arts Incorporated, because it is so grassroots, you know, mm -hmm. we're still, you know, we're only in our fifth year, could, uh, could kind of fill in all the holes from all the cuts. But there are things like the fact that we still have family literacy night, mm -hmm. that certainly would have gone to the wayside, you yeah. know, and, and here it is, it's still there, we still got it going. We have our, our high school, college and career support program, yeah. and so yeah. It sounds like you have a, uh, a great program, um, a great model that, yeah. um, that other schools could, uh, uh, could take and and learn from and absolutely and, um, and we welcome I'll tell you this we would welcome anybody to mm -hmm. come to see uh, any of the family literacy nights that's 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 at the mm -hmm. core of the school's philosophy and I, I think this organization mm -hmm. as well is mm -hmm. you know because um, everybody you know every everybody benefits when we work together that's so great. you know you could anybody could come to Kinsella Magnet School of Performing Arts it's kind mm -hmm. of an open door policy and really have a tour look around or be part of our, our do, board. Do you want to share your uh, website site, um, the, your web address and phone number so that, that any of our viewers yeah, absolutely. Um, can. Um, definitely check us out on Facebook, uh, Kinsella Magnet. Uh, we put all our, uh, all our photos and videos on there. We actually live stream our shows. Uh, um, 
and that's very exciting right now. Certainly go to our website, uh, kinsellamagnet.org, uh, or you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter as well. Kinsella that's the school. Arts. Now, and then I was gonna say, do you wanna tell them about this? You want me to tell them about the not-for-profit yeah. as well? Yeah, okay, so, uh, um, <laughs> so absolutely, because this is the thing, is these two organizations work together. So check out kinsellaartsinc.org, and you could also check us out on Facebook too. So we also have pictures of, of the programs there mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on our Facebook page. So check it out. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Joan and Eddie, for joining us today. And thank you so you. much for having us. You thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have with me today Nora Duncan, who is the state director for AARP. Well, let me start with telling of just AARP okay. in general, because I think sometimes we have... Um, there's a misperception about what we do. You know, people think we sell insurance, for instance, and we don't sell insurance, but we do. We have products and, and, and lines of, of business that we, we work with on our, on our for profit side. Here in Connecticut, we are a nonprofit, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit social mission organization with a membership. Okay. which sounds like a mouthful, but it actually makes sense. And as we go through, you'll probably um, see how it works. We have about 610,000 members in Connecticut and about 38 million nationwide. And our role is really to help people age with dignity the way they want to and to be able to live their best lives as mm -hmm. they age. So through outreach, through education, through uh, advocacy, we work to accomplish that. And it can show up in your community in a million different ways, which makes us sort of complicated and mm -hmm. unique as to some nonprofits. But in terms of our work here with our 600,000 plus members and our team of volunteers, which I'd love to tell you about also, we've got about 150 volunteers mm. in our state office, um, plus a whole bunch more who do other things, who are in our driver safety program and our tax aid program. But we show up in community. And when I say show up in community, that's a, a, a big term or a big way to say it, but there's many ways that we can show up. So we have programs, and I'd say 90% of them are run by our volunteers. Uh, so if you called me and said, I have a women's group who'd like to talk about uh, preventing frauds and scams in their community for themselves and their loved ones, would you come in and do a presentation? I would say, absolutely. I have a team of trained volunteers in AARP's Fraud Watch Network who can come out and present what we usually call the con artist's playbook, which is a way for us to educate folks about what to be on the lookout for. You know, we all think we're super smart and we're not gonna fall for something, mm. but yet over and over and over again, we see people Absolutely. fall for things because they get put in the right uh, emotional mm -hmm. position to fall. And that's what a scam artist does, right? So a scam artist is there working 24 hours a day to get your money out of your hands. That's right. Where you're working mm -hmm. 24 hours a day to do all the things you do, right? Which none of which are probably trying to lie, cheat, and steal. So you don't think, you know, you're not on the lookout all the time. Um, but that's our one program we have. There are quite a few. So the, the fraud and scam prevention, we have a program called Disrupt Aging, which is really a, a movement about looking at aging in a very different way. So that, um, and in both community groups, in academic settings, and in professional settings, but in businesses, with industry, with trade uh, groups, we're really taking a look and saying, are, why do we treat aging so much differently than we treat mm -hmm. anything else? You know, why is it okay, I always use this example, why is it okay to say, um, to give you a birthday card on your 50th that looks like, you know, that has a, has a coffin on it, or some joke about, <laughs> about gray hair and wrinkles, when we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that with anything else. And there's actually some, some science behind how you think about aging mm -hmm. is going to be uh, indicative of how you age. Mm -hmm. So if there's positivity, mm -hmm. there's a lot more positivity. Yeah. And the list goes on. We do um, outreach around, um, you know, how to basically understand all the consumer protections around utilities and, and not pay more than you have to. Mm -hmm. We help people navigate the world of uh, unpaid family caregiving and so that can be anybody can be a caregiver, you know, at any time. Right. You know, today I might be here with you and I might check my voicemail when I am done and find out that my mother or my aunt had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And now I am in a world that I was not in 
when I sat down in this chair, and that mm -hmm. is most people aren't prepared, and so we try to figure out ways to help them, and the list goes on from there. And all of these outreach activities tie back to, to the mission, you know, to help people age the way they want to age, to live their life the best way they can, to explore their real possibilities. Um, and, and these things are, are things we'll do for free when people call. We organize it the best That's way we can, right. mm -hmm. utilizing our volunteers, um, and, and find a way to bring the programming to all age groups. Um, and even some of the work we do on outreach focuses around educating people on legislation we're trying to pass or that we have passed. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if a bill becomes a law and nobody knows it's a law, right. what's the point, right? That's so right. there's sort of a couple prongs of our, our mm -hmm. education and outreach program. Uh, and then there's just some of the fun stuff, which I have, we like to call it sugar, sugar medicine. Right? There's an itty bitty little bit of, uh, of something to learn, but you might be learning it at the winery uh -huh. and having a free wine tasting, uh -huh. or you might be learning it before you see a free movie screening of a, you know, the next mm. blockbuster. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we yeah. uh, offer our members and, and non-members alike uh, some pretty significant value and uh, put, oh, you have to add a little mission into each of those things. So enjoy mm -hmm. your glass of wine or come out and have a healthy cooking demonstration right. at a really nice restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll, we'll be in, in, you know, West Hartford Center or, you know, at a restaurant here in Farmington doing that. So you're enjoying a little bit of a time out on us. Mm -hmm. But in there, we might have a message about, you know, you're, you're learning how to, how to cook uh, multi uh, pronged meals that appeal to multiple generations. So if you're a caregiver, you know, here's a way to cook healthy that your kid <laughs> likes and your mom likes and do it with a little fun and have a night out um, and, and take our caregiver resources with you so that when you do have to make the next decision about caregiving, you've got something in your hands that can be a, a quick a quick reference mm -hmm. guide that can get right. you to the right place and things like that. So, so how do people find out about those programs? So there's a variety of ways. The easiest thing to do on a regular basis is, uh, well, there's a couple things. So whether you're a member or not a member, it's important to be able to get, the easiest way I have to communicate with people directly and the cheapest way I have is via email. Mm -hmm. So it's going to aarp.org forward slash CT and in there, you scroll down a little bit and it'll say, I want to hear from the Connecticut State Office. And then I've got your email. The opportunity for me to tell you when there's something happening, you know, within a 20 mile radius of your zip code, for instance, mm -hmm. is really the best way to get the first invite to the great free event that sells out. You know, the movie theater only holds mm -hmm. so many people, okay. right? The cooking class only right. holds so many people. Um, the other thing to do is to follow us on social media. We are very active on Facebook and on Twitter, and you know there's information both um, around the events, mm -hmm. uh, you know okay. tidbits of things, action alerts about what's going on at the Capitol uh, or the federal government le level that we're involved in and taking a position on. There's just some fun stuff. There's um, interesting videos about what we're up to or what organizations that we are connected to in some way are up to in the community. You know, uh, it's, it's really kind of an all-inclusive, and that's AARPCT mm -hmm. for both of those handles. Okay. So social media, our website, and uh, the aarp.org forward slash CT, where you can get the emails, also has um, rich information about blogs and a list of all of our sort of public-facing events, I would say. It's not going to have your woman's book club or whatever that mm -hmm. you invited me mm -hmm. to on it because you're inviting me into a private Right. Location. Right. But maybe the community center has invited mm -hmm. me in and they say this is open to everyone. So that'll be that'll be there. Wonderful. And people can can reach out to me directly if they are interested in inviting us in on one of the, the many topics. Um, that is is pretty easy. It's it's N Duncan at AARP dot org. Okay. N D U N C A N at AARP dot org. Okay. And I'll connect people to the right place and we can see what we can do. Uh, and again, what we do for one, we do for all. We do not say that you have to be a member to go to mm -hmm. any of these okay. things. Um, you're not gonna necessarily, you're not gonna get the postcard, 
if you're not a member, right? right? But mm -hmm. you could get the email. There's there's very few things that we restrict to just members. Some of our local offerings with local nonprofits to get the admission discount, mm -hmm. for instance, that will be restricted. Um, but very few things are, and age is not an issue. If I'm going to come in and talk about the retirement savings crisis in this country and in this state and what we've done on the mm -hmm. advocacy front to try to make a dent, I don't want to talk to people who are retired and out of the workforce the same way I want to talk to people who are still going to be planning for their retirement, mm, right. right? I mean, I'd love mm -hmm. to connect with people so they can connect to their children and their grandchildren. But if it's about getting you to understand that there's a new opportunity to save for your retirement, if you don't currently have that opportunity, I want to talk to the person who's 25 mm -hmm. and can start saving for sure. their retirement now so that when they are 75 years old, they have a much different reality than if they didn't start saving now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think um, recognizing that we're, we're not really age specific and that mm -hmm. anybody can be a caregiver, right? right. You know, especially mm -hmm. think about all the people being raised by their grandparents, mm -hmm. you know, so True. now you're, you're 22 and you're suddenly faced with that, that thing I just talked about, right? Where mom had a stroke or grandma mm -hmm. had a stroke and you're in that position. And, and you know, facing something that, mm -hmm. that you know, a lot of people don't face until they're so much, true. much later in life. Mm -hmm. That's so, so true. So any age, and, and we'd love to be invited out to places. So mm -hmm. these, this kind of show is a really great way to, to get that message get to a new out. audience. Yeah. Great, great. You mentioned uh, advocacy and working on legislation. Can you tell us, uh, tell me a little bit more about some of the hot topics? Yeah, sure. Um, well, this year's legislative session went on uh, agonizingly long. Uh, because we did not get a budget until the very, well, if you talk about when the governor signed it, the very beginning, mm -hmm. end of October, beginning of November. But we have some buckets of um, topics that we work in here in Connecticut. They'll fall around the areas of that unpaid family caregiver I talked about, and, and programs that not only support the person who needs the care, but the caregiver as well. So mm -hmm. for instance, the Alzheimer's respite program, that is a, a budget item. So we have for quite some time gone ahead and, and worked to try to make sure, well, in, in recent years, we've been working to mitigate cuts a lot more than we've been working on expansion. That's just the reality of the budget situation we have. But that's an example. That's a program that really isn't a lot of money, but that people can sign up for. So if they are caring for someone mm -hmm. at home who has Alzheimer's, so in your home, you can get just that little bit of time mm. where you can be sure that your loved one is being cared for and you can go take care of what you need to take care of. So that can be as simple as, uh, I really need a haircut to, it's not, it's not like I'm going away on a week's vacation respite. It's mm -hmm. a couple of hours, a half day. Um, programs such as the Connecticut Home Care Program for Elders. Uh, that is a program where when you still have some liquid assets left, mm -hmm. you and you're at a certain level of, of risk of going into a nursing home, you can come in and get some of those in-home supports at a, at a, at a rate that, that is a little bit more subsidized and so that we prevent people going into a nursing home. So if it's getting to a point where the, the care that needed is so complicated that you need the extra help as the caregiver and you don't feel like bankrupting someone today by sending them to a nursing home right. and we don't wanna pay three times as much for the care in an institutional setting versus a home setting, this program uh, gets some of that support in the door for you. And, and again, that's been cut, you know, so many times over the years mm -hmm. and different levels of care have been reduced and we were, we were able to mitigate that so that the program can continue on. Um, and then there's some programs about actual, like, you know, supporting paid family and medical leave so that people can take the time. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. We work on consumer protections around utilities. Okay. Because people who are low income, uh, particularly seniors who are living on social security alone, for instance, um, they're paying a disproportionate share of their uh, monthly income to utilities, upwards of 33% for some wow. people. Mm -hmm. And that's just not feasible. Mm -hmm. And that's not, a, that's not a thing that we can 
we can live in. If you're pulling in, you know, $20,000 a year and your heating bill is $500 a month, mm -hmm. you know, this That's is rough. this is not an option. Right. There are some ways you can make cuts, but some of them create serious safety problems for people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't want folks having to make those tough decisions. This sounds cliche, but people do make decisions mm -hmm. about paying rent, paying utilities, getting medication and getting food. Those are mm -hmm. sort of the things that people can't avoid. I may be able to get the generic peanut butter instead of the brand name, but the, unfortunately the generic electricity suppliers, the third party <laughs> electricity suppliers, for instance, have proven time and time again that, that the majority of people do not save mm -hmm. uh, when they go into it. There's not really a way to get this cheaper energy and we wanna make sure that we're doing the um, best to, we can to, to watch those consumer protections, to fight rate cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we work on retirement savings issues and, and financial security issues uh, that affect people of all ages. Mm -hmm. um, starting from the time you get your first job with uh, a piece of legislation that we're working on implementing now that allows for um, the 600 or so, so thousand people in Connecticut right now who are working but don't have access to workplace savings. So when I say that, um, I am lucky enough to have a uh, retirement account that gets deducted right from my paycheck, mm -hmm. right? Set it and forget it. And then every, you know, I get to go look at my account. I say, what a good job I did. I watched the dollars grow. We hope that the, that the, um, that the dollars continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, but 600,000 people don't have access to that set it and forget it. Right. And um, a lot of different studies uh, from some pretty reputable places around the country have come up with the same conclusion. And that is that um, if you have that set it and forget it, you're 15 times more likely to save for your own retirement than if you don't. Right. And a lot of the people, a lot of those 600,000 people are lower wage. And you know what? It, you can't walk in and just buy a product from an investment house, mm -hmm. right? Um, now there are some, but it's, it, this is a scary world for a lot of people who are new to, to saving for retirement, who are trying to pay the bills all the time. I don't believe that because you're lower income, or because you're, you're currently working for, for a smaller company that doesn't have this offering that you shouldn't be allowed to save for retirement. Mm -hmm. So this piece of legislation um, sets it up so it's payroll deduction. And, and it, it set it and forget it and, and we're working on implementation, but that's for, that's for people who are in the workforce, not for retirees, mm -hmm. right? I wanna right. make sure that people are learning about that when they're early on, early on mm -hmm. so they can save as much That's as right. possible. And then we don't need as many programs like the home care program for elders. We don't need as many people on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. We don't need people mm -hmm. having to apply for, um, for utilities, uh, help paying their utility bills if they have the dollars that they've saved on their own, mm -hmm. right, over right. time. And so we're trying to make sure that there are these opportunities. It's not mm -hmm. gonna fix anything for the current generation of retirees, but what if we can help start fixing it for the next generation, right. the generation after that? Mm -hmm. And maybe we're looking at a whole different world where it's, you know, there's really not, you know, very few people have pensions anymore, we know that, right? But the, the different stools, or the different, mm -hmm. the legs of the stool that everyone always talks about, mm -hmm. more people have that I saved independently leg. Right, right. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about when you talked about the um, respite for like Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. is that for members only? Oh, no, that's, that, a that's a state program. That's a state program. That's anybody who qualifies for the okay. program. All right. Yeah, that has nothing. That's that's a, a Connecticut program. Okay. It's not an AARP program. We advocate for that program in I the see. state budget okay. along with other allies in that that world okay so good. um good you know every 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 line item usually has a lobbyist mm -hmm. and and some of them are you know that's one of our our go-to's because it really does prevent that higher level of care from being needed if your caregiver burns out and can't keep you at home mm -hmm. what happens that's right you end up in in, in a level of care that is just so much more expensive mm -hmm. and that when you know you're lower income at that point you use up your resources and the uh, the dollars uh, go to the nursing home mm -hmm. which is fine if it's needed but if it's not we, we don't flip people over to Medicaid as quickly and, and the thing with like the Connecticut home care program for elders mm -hmm. when the estate settles later and the house is sold or the money goes back yeah 
so it's uh, and we're able to, to, to keep people people don't want to they want to stay home and home doesn't have to be the home I've always been in right I'll give you another example okay. so um, we've worked on legislation that is sort of opt-in for towns but it allows for something called accessible dwellings it allows uh, towns to take a stab at and only two have so far because it's that new but it, it um, you get to not have the regular zoning you'd have for if you wanted to build an addition to the house mm -hmm. but there's temporary units you can bring in that are kind of like little pods that drop down so if your loved one has to sell their house because they can't be there anymore and maybe you can't fit them inside of your house mm -hmm. or you're trying to have that little bit of space that prevents the family uh, meltdown from happening that we can all think about if we have to move in with our, our parents or mm -hmm. our parents have to move in with <laughs> us or vice versa. There's actually some statute that allows towns to work to, to allow these kind of little dwellings mm -hmm. to be temp they're temporary structures, right? Um, so we're not gonna have to worry that we're gonna build a frat house in somebody's backyard, right? right? right. But that's another opportunity for people to, to care for their loved ones mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense for them. And uh, I think Stonington was the most recent town to sort of tackle mm -hmm. this. But it doesn't force towns to do things. It just sort of opens the path and gives them the opportunity to say, we've got to deal with the fact mm -hmm. that we have an aging population. And, and um, we're going we're gonna to deal with it in a way that makes sense under state statute. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a lot more um, uh, elderly people being able to stay at home? Um, I've, I'd like to say we're seeing a lot more in that we have been able to mitigate some of these severe cuts. There are so many problems with the state budget right now that I don't think the true um, consequences of so much of what happened mm -hmm. are, I'm able to see that yet, but I, there are going to be consequences of that state budget on the older pop, there's gonna be consequences mm -hmm. on everyone, right. but there are going to be consequences on seniors. I mean, it, we may have done better than we thought we were going to do with some of these programs, but there is no joy mm -hmm. in that budget. Um, and so I think, I think it is, remains to be seen, but I think also as you're, when we're talking about just the state budget, you have to be looking at what these other possibilities are. So accessible dwellings. Mm -hmm. Am I making, am I being, allowing another route to help keep people from having to go into institutional care to save those dollars a different way or, mm -hmm. to, or to, to not have to take on a, 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 an increase. Okay. And when we talk about some of the federal health care, I mean, there were some pretty scary proposal, proposals about block granting Medicare and Medicaid, for instance, and when you're in that position, the person who needs the dollars the most might not be able to get them, and, we, and then it's what do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't, no one has that answer, which is why we haven't figured out the health care issues. Right. It turns out it's complicated. It is complicated, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it's not as easy as repeal and replace. It it's quite complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. So well, we just have to look at a lot of the options that we have and be as creative as possible right. so that people can stay home. I, I think the, the private market has really done a good job in making new services also, mm -hmm. though, that help people who have a little bit more means be able to stay home longer and better mm -hmm. and more independently. Right. So it's not just what AARP or the state can do, it's also what the private market must do, mm -hmm. must, you know, the private market is gonna be driven to the demand. And if there's money to be made, that's great. So there needs to be more innovation. And actually mm -hmm. we do some, some work at the national level on, on funding um, some of those innovative startup ideas and, mm -hmm. and looking yeah. at, at how we serve uh, the market's needs, not, you know, not um, we just they, they 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 you can't just keep producing uh, products and services that focus on 24 to 35 year olds. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> that's not really who the whole population is. <laughs> that's true. So we try to push innovation there. That's true. Um, tell me the importance of voter engagement on the different issues. Yeah, so we work on legislation, obviously, and ob the people who are elected to make the final decisions about this are elected by voters. Mm -hmm. um, with 600,000 plus members in Connecticut, that's a pretty big block of mm -hmm. people that we would like our members to be engaged on, on issues related to, to elections, but also the general public. And um, AARP members actually as a whole vote more than non-members. Mm, we, have, we have actual data on that, but, mm -hmm. but people over 50 vote more than anyone. 
So our membership is age 50 and up. And mm -hmm. so we think that it's not only um, that we provide a service in doing some voter outreach and education around our issues, uh, but also that it is, it is it's really an obligation of ours to make mm -hmm. sure people have information that is accurate, timely, uh, and, and tells a, gives a true picture of what the opportunities and concerns are in, in our election cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we're nonpartisan, so we're not bipartisan, we're nonpartisan. So mm -hmm. we work on issues, and sometimes those issues have, are, are, are voted on in a way that is completely partisan, and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had 100% yes votes on number one pieces of legislation, and I've had some votes that went straight down by party line, and then I've had others that are a complete mix-up. Um, but with the 2018 elections, Everybody from the General Assembly to all the constitutional officers and every member of Congress, uh, in, except Senator Blumenthal, is up for election. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big year. Mm -hmm. Yes, it so is. So it, you know, it may not be a presidential election year, but in terms of what it means to people who live here, it's the most important mm -hmm. kind of year. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that uh, we're focusing on key races. Uh, the General Assembly right now, the Senate is split 50-50 in terms of uh, Democrats and Republicans. The House is the closest margin it's been in a long time. The governor's race is up for grabs. Uh, elections were a lot closer uh, a couple years ago in our constitutional races than they had been previously. So we'll be engaging candidates. I'm not completely sure what that's gonna look like mm -hmm. yet, but we'll be engaging candidates as we always do and we'll be making it, um, that engagement part of our member and non-member voter engagement outreach okay. uh, in a Great. variety of ways. Great. Well, as we um, wrap up, I uh, really appreciate, Nora, your being here today. and. Uh